Happy Sabbath and welcome to the 13th lesson of the third quarter of the Teens Cornerstone Connections lesson of 2023. In this week, we have Baraka in the mission story, Amy and Ariana, and in the orchestra, we have Amy and Ariana on the violins, um, Sakai on the trumpet, and Sid on the piano. And for the lesson panel, we have the teens from Nairobi Central, along with their teens teachers. Enjoy. The mission story for today is entitled God of Beats, of Red Beats. And it comes from the country of Latvia, like the previous three. And just a few fun facts about the country. The first Christmas tree ever was decorated in Latvia in the year 1510. The Venta waterfall located in Latvia is also the widest waterfall in Europe. Now getting into the story, the story is centered around a little boy named Creves who comes from school one day and he excitedly tells his mom about all the things he was taught at school. He tells her of the learnt about Michaelis, who is a, a pagan god from Latvian mythology. And basically what they were taught was when you plant something in the garden, at the edge of the garden, you're supposed to plant red beets or beetroots for the God. And after hearing this, the mother, being an Adventist mother, she became very upset because what they're teaching her child at school didn't align with what her child was being taught at home and at church. And so as most mothers would do, she went to the school very upset and she wanted to speak to the teacher who taught her this. She went to the school, caused a huge commotion, and complained that she didn't want her child learning about pagan gods and Latvian mythology in school. And so they heard her complaints, and as a result, they, they even offered her to start teaching Bible lessons instead. However, this came in the, on the condition that she would teach pottery as well, given that the, the teacher for pottery was leaving the school and they needed someone else to do it. However, she didn't know how to anything about pottery, and so she was in a dilemma. And so as one should do, she, she prayed to God and asked him for guidance. And sooner or later, she was teaching both Bible and poetry at the, pottery at the school. And as she was teaching Bible, many of the teachers began to become interested in the subjects that she was talking about. And sooner or later, Many teachers became converted and they converted their families as well. Um, part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help support Pathfinders and other children in Latvia. The offering will help construct a building in Latvia's capital, Riga, where children can learn more about the Bible and the real God of heaven who created red beets and every other vegetable in the world. I'll now say a short prayer for the 13th Sabbath offering. Let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of life and everything you've given us. Dear God, we'd like to pray that you may please bless the 13th Sabbath offering so that many more children may learn about you and they may not be misguided by other false gods. Thank you for hearing, for it's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Greetings to you all and welcome to our lesson for today. The title of the lesson will be Knowing God's Will. Knowing God's Will. This is the 13th lesson of the lesson discussion for the Cornerstone Connections and uh, it will be discussed by me and my fellow teens and before we proceed I'd like to introduce those who will be serving with me on the panel today and I'd like to start from my extreme right. Please say your name and uh, greet our uh, congregation. Well hello to you all. My name is Mikhail Flex. Hi, I'm Finley Chabari. Hi, my name is Benithian Sanders. Happy Sabbath, my name is Teacher Donna Opil. Okay, welcome to our lesson discussion. As we consider what knowing God's will is, we'd like to start with a word of prayer from Silas before we proceed. Let's pray. Our oh, Father, our Lord of above in heaven, we thank you this day, we thank you for your love and your care as we do this lesson. We pray that you may help us learn and all those who are watching us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'd like to read a short story from the book of Judges, chapter 6, verse 36 up to 40, which will set the pace for us to understand how we should know God's will. The Bible says in Judges, chapter 6, verse 36 to 40, and God said unto Gideon, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, uh, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it is dry on the earth beside, then shall I know that you will save Israel by your hand, as you have said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And God said, and Gideon said unto God, Let not your anger be hot against me. I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray you, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Now Gideon put a test and he wanted to know whether what he was going to do was the will of God. So he actually pleaded with God to show him by signs whether it was his will. So the first time he asked that the fleece would be wet and the ground around it be dry and for sure he could squeeze out a bowl of water from the fleece. But the next time he asked for the ground around it to have dew and the fleece to be dry. And this could actually show the working of God. Now this was science, or we can say a miracle, that would show God's will. But is this really how we should know the will of God? We'll be exploring that throughout the lesson today, and we'll see how best it is for us to know what the will of God is. So even as we begin, I'd like to invite you, uh, Finley, to please read First uh, Corinthians chapter 14 verse 15, even as we seek to find out how is it that we know God's will. First Corinthians chapter 14 verse 15. And it says, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will seek with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. So, finding God's will, it's a hot topic in among the teenagers. And so it is during this time when the teenagers are trying to identify their identity. And so most of them are, uh, most of them genuinely want to know and follow God's will. And if I may ask my fellow panelists, in which circumstances in your life did you find, did you want to seek God's will? I'll start with my far left. Thank you for the question. Um, several situations, but I'll just mention one. Uh, for example, after high school, uh, one area in my life that I wanted to know God's will 
is what career should I pursue? There are so many careers. Should I be a lawyer or a teacher or a doctor or a farmer? So I really wanted to know God's will in that regard. Okay. For me, I think is what to do on weekends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like weekend you're free, but you don't really know what to do with your time and whether what you do is useful to your salvation or not. Yeah. Yeah, so what to do in we- on weekends is a hard decision. I think I also find it as a hard decision sometimes because you're not sure if I'm free, what should I prioritize first? I'd say one of the most difficult questions I've ever asked is whom to marry. It's not a very easy question to answer. And also one of the other difficult things I found was what career to choose. Sometimes you found you have two jobs that are coming at you or you have two places, two things that you'd like to pursue. Then you really need God's wisdom to actually discern what is the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. And it may be possible that all of them are right. So I think those are very hard decisions sometimes that we are called upon to make. Yes, um, I agree. And for me, the one decision that really I really had to trust God's will was when I graduated from high school, I had to see what course exactly am I taking. And this was because I had a lot of interest in nursing, in business, and in other factors. So I really had to see what God is telling me, where, what I should pursue in university. So that was a really tough decision that I had to rely on God's will. To me, it was during last week, but one, where I prayed to God to know whether the last Sabbath was the right time to be baptized. Mm. And so I'll give my panelists some list to choose from the most difficult one and the least difficult when it comes to knowing God's will. The first one is whom to marry, what career to pursue, what to do this weekend, where to work this summer, whom to ask out for a date, how to choose friends, what book to read for pleasure, what to say on Facebook, whether or not to trust in Jesus, whether or not to get involved in a local church. So my answer is not necessarily from this, but for me, the, mo- um, the most difficult decision I'll say is what teacher Nico said, what to prioritize first. And this is because as the more you, you know, get closer to God, is the more you get sensitive to what you're doing. And whether it's right or wrong, you know, should I be continuing, should I stop? And it's really something that I really internalize and I have to constantly pray about it. You know, what should I put first? My phone, my social media apps, and all these are factors that add up to being the most difficult. But the least one I will say, probably out of all this, I would say on Facebook, I, I don't say anything. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, for me, I think, uh, what book to read for pleasure, whether to read the Bible or read any book that is on the library. Is that a difficult decision or an easy decision? It's a difficult decision mm-hmm. because you don't know what this, what all the other books in the library have and you at least have an idea of what the Bible has to offer. So you think of doing something different today because you already know what the Bible is talking about, Mm -hmm. but which one specifically to read is a difficult decision. Okay. Donna? Um, I think for me, ranking, uh, the most difficult uh, would be what or whom to marry, uh, because uh, when you're deciding whom to settle down with, you're deciding on a person who will not only influence your life here on earth, but also will influence your afterlife. So I think that's a very difficult decision that needs um, a lot of prayer and a lot of counsel from God. Thank you. So for me, uh, I say the least difficult decision of this was whether or not to trust Jesus. 
I think from the experience I have had, it seems to me that trusting Jesus is something that we should all be able to agree shouldn't be a difficult decision. And sometimes it gets really hard. I, I have to acknowledge that. But when you don't see where your money, your food, your livelihood will come from and somebody tells you, trust in Jesus at this time, yeah, it might look like a very difficult decision. Then, uh, yeah, of course, the decision to whom to marry is very difficult and also what career to pursue because all those are things that influence the course of your life. So, for me, I'd say that for me. So, to me, the most difficult one is how to choose friends mm. because friends influence you and there's a saying which goes, show me your friend and I'll tell you your character. Mm -hmm. And the least difficult is what to say on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Facebook sometimes or any other social media, it may be Facebook, uh, it might be Twitter. I think you can influence a lot of people just by your words. I think I personally find it difficult because there are very many different people who will be seeing what you're saying. And when you put out your thoughts, you open up a lot about yourself on there. So you need to be a bit careful with what you say and what you do not say. So we'd like to see some of the things that happened in Gideon's, Gideon's life to actually show us why it was very important for him to know God's will. Because the book of uh, uh, Judges chapter 6 tells us Gideon was chosen by God. So I'd like Flex to just share with us some of the things that were happening in Gideon's life that shows us that he needed to know God's will before making any of these decisions. Yes, thank you, Teacher Nico. So I'll be reading from Judges chapter 6 to 7. And if you have your Bibles, please, you can follow along. And it begins by saying, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites, because the power of Midian was so oppressive the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountains, in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joas, the Abiez, Ab Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord God turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. The Lord said to Gideon, with 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. When the, when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Beth Shittah toward Zereha and Tabath. Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh were called out and they pursued the Midianites, Gideon. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. Now you see from this, it has left out a bit of context or a bit of the story for example, it left out the part for how to reduce the number God told Gideon to tell everyone who was afraid to go into battle to go back home. And this was to prove to God that this is so that the man cannot say they defeated the Midianites by their own will but by the power of God. And another part was how the test for the lapping of water, the people who went down on the down on their knees and drunk with their faces were told to go home while the people who were lapped from their hands were told to go fight and that's why there were 300. And out of this story, I would like to ask my fellow panelists, 
in your opinion, what is the most important lesson of the story? Maybe Silas can take this one. Okay, I think the most important part of, the st of this story is when God reduced them by drinking the water. Okay, it's perhaps you won't really understand why those who drank with their faces went home, but it's reasonable because it's a crucial moment. You're going into battle and you take your time and the luxury to drink the water in peace, knowing you're headed to battle. But the people who really wanted to save their people had the hurry and the urgency and had to look out to see, is the enemy approaching? That's why they use their hands. So we can see here, it's people who are ready for battle are the only ones who went. Very, very nice points. One other thing I got from the lesson was trust is something that has a heavy factor in actually accepting God's will. Gideon had to trust God with 300 men to fight a battle where the Midianites said the camels were outnumbered and the men were among the thousands. So the trust Gideon had had to be strong for him to actually let go of his men and only go to battle with 300 people. Another question I would like to ask is, what does this story teach us about knowing one's purpose in life? Maybe teacher Dorothy can. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so one question that we normally battle with um, as, as teenagers and even as adults is, um, do I have a purpose in this life? Do I have a will in this life? And what is God's purpose for me? So for me, I'd first start by answering uh, and by saying that God has a purpose for each and every one of us in this life, okay? And then um, it, it was very interesting how uh, the Lord dis displayed uh, Gideon's purpose for him. Gideon was just minding his own business. He was threshing the wheat um, in the field, but in his head, he had thoughts about his people. He had thoughts about uh, saving his people uh, from their enemies, the Midianites. And at that point is when, where the angel approached uh, Gideon. So the lesson I pick from this is God um, meets us uh, at our everyday um, activities, our everyday duties. So whether you're um, at school or whether you're in church or whatever activities you're doing, the Lord can uh, send a, a messenger to you so that he, he's able to tell you your will or yeah, your purpose or your will. So let's not um, despise our common activities because the Lord can meet us there. And then um, the, the last thing I pick out in this story is that the Lord can use, um, can use anyone uh, who is willing to be used of him because we can see Gideon um, saying he was the weakest. He's from the weakest tribe, and um, he, he was weak, and he was from the least tribe in Israel, but the Lord still uh, saw it fit to choose him. So even as teenagers, um, we might be the least, uh, even in church, or even in school, uh, we might be maybe just in Form 1, but the Lord can see it fit to use you uh, where you are. Thank you. That was very... A very nice, very nice point. Another point which I like to say is one, uh, one thing you can know about one's purpose in life is constant communication with God. And you see this with Gideon. Every time God told him to do something, when he said, go, he said, I am the weak, I am the least in my tribe, the least in my family. So in, for him to know his purpose, he had to communicate to God, tell him his problems. But God still answered them in his own way. Of course, we don't know the, the plans God has for us, but we know they're good. But for us to trust him, we have to show him our problem, which means communication um, with Jesus. Uh, another question, and this one we can ask Teacher Nico, what does this story teach us about the mission for God's remnant people? Yeah, that's an interesting question on the remnant people. I'd say, there was a remnant in the story of Gideon. It first started with a large group of people, and the number kept going down from almost 22,000, then 10,000, and suddenly going down all the way up to 300. You're wondering, what was God saying? 
Um, I believe God can work with just a few people to accomplish his work. He doesn't need the whole group to actually do a work. And God is actually saying, if you trust me to do it, it's not in the power and might of what you have. You might think you have something small in your hand, but God is saying that is what I will work through. And we see this through the remnant who we consider the 300 people who remained. The remnant are the ones who actually ensured they won the battle against the Midianites. It wasn't the whole group of people. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we consider ourselves the remnant church of God. And God is saying there have been several people who follow Christ throughout all the ages. But as you are the remnant church in this last day and age, I want to work with you to finish the work and to usher in the coming of Jesus Christ. And it's true that as the remnant, we might face more challenges than all the other generations that have been there. But it might be just a similar case to the 300 what is 300 men against a really large army or a really large group of people? Sometimes it might look like we are few, we are the people who are challenged with sin the most, but God is saying the remnant and the mission are like the people who are going to fight against the Midianites. Though few, though you have many temptations with you, I am still with you and will help you in the battle against the devil even in the last days. That's what I see for the remnant there. Thank you, thank you. Very, very nice ex expansion of mm -hmm. the question. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe the last thing I can say is to capture this story in five words or more is few things can lead to success. Mm. Few things can lead to success. Amen. Maybe, yes, and I agree with that because uh, from this story I learned that God is not um, interested in uh, big numbers as much as he's interested in the character of mm. people. So mm. he's, he's willing to use people who are, uh, who are trusting of him, who are obedient of him, and not people who are fearful or people who are prideful. Thanks for that. So I'd like to ask Finley to please read the book of Judges chapter 8, verse 33 to 35, which is our key text for today. And you can share with us a few of the lessons that we learned from this book. I believe maybe there are some people on the panel who might share one or two lessons on the same. Judges chapter 8, verse 33 to 35. So Judges chapter 8, verse 33 to 35 says, No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Perith as their god. And did, not, and did not remember the Lord their God, who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jerubal, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. And so we should review the key text of the lesson, which I will ask Lex to read for us. All right, the key text of the lesson. It comes from Judges chapter 8, verse 33 35, and says, No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites set up Baal Berith as their God and did not remember the Lord their God, who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jerub Baal, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. So what role does the spiritual leader play in, us in safeguarding God's people from backsliding? Silas? Okay, I'd say the role of the a spiritual leader to guard people from backsliding would be just to encourage everyone at their point of struggle and give them a reason to continue and to push forward. So for me, the spiritual leader in the story of Gideon, Gideon was passing the message from God to the Israelites, and so that played an important role. What are the idols that we are tempted to worship today? 
Well, I believe there are several things that uh, we have that we can worship. It may be our jobs, it may be our parents, it may be celebrities, the music we listen to, the sports, all these things are gods and idols that we may worship. Maybe even be our phones and social media or following. There are several things that we can worship today. The question we ask ourselves is, do we put these things before God? Is it possible that if our spiritual leaders were to be removed, then we'd go back to these things? After Jesus has saved us, do we go back to these things or do we still stick with what God is calling us to do? So those are some idols that we may have. Okay. Yeah. I think that an idol is anything you put before God. Like in the morning when you wake up, instead of praying first, maybe it's one of those things you decide to do first before you go to God in prayer. Yeah, um, another idol, as uh, Dijani has uh, mentioned several of them, um, but um, I, our education, is it an idol? Uh, do we choose to maybe focus uh, on our schoolwork, but not uh, give focus to the work of God, maybe coming to church and, um, and serving? And also our careers or our jobs, um, are we giving it more time? Um, other than uh, spending time in furthering the work of God. So anything that uh, we put ahead of God's work, then that becomes an idol. So for me, the most common idol today is money. Because people see money as everything, which is not. So the next question is, have you ever failed to remember the Lord, even when God has rescued you from the hands of all? From the hands of all your enemies, Lex? Um, yes, there were times, maybe an example is when I was in school and I'll pray every day, God help me in this test, help me in this test, and I succeed and I get a decent or good grade. And then I don't thank him, but say, yeah, I, I worked hard for this, read a lot. So there were times and it's not good. So mostly, when you start a journey, everyone prays. Yes. But when you arrive safely, you don't even remember to thank God. So also, reflect on the phrase, they also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. How can you be more intentional about expressing thankfulness the people who have had a spiritual impact in your life? Mm, I, I could take that. Um, for us, we should always express a gift of thanksgiving to those who have been our spiritual leaders. I could share with the panel here that how many times have you thanked your Sabbath school teacher, your elder, your pastor, or anyone for all the lessons that they've imparted to you? I think uh, it's really important for us to show thanksgiving to them. And one of the things we can do is honor them even as they, uh, let's say, they leave their roles uh, like Gideon, uh, then you shouldn't go back to the things that you were doing before. I'd like us to quickly go to the flashlight section of the lesson. Uh, so uh, I can ask Silas, please read it to us and share with us some lessons you learned from the spirit of prophecy based on this flashlight. We were reading chapter 53 of Patriarchs and Prophets. Okay, it says, mm -hmm. like, like Israel, Christians too often held to the, to the influence of the world and to conform to its principles and custom in order to secure the friendship of the ungodly, but in the end it will be found that these professed friends are the most dangerous in fools. The Bible plainly teaches that there can be no harmony between the people of God and the world. Mm. So this says that you can't be a friend to someone of the world, a very close friend, and be in church and keep up with the same influence you had and the same 
energy in the work of God because mm. of the influence around you, the influence of your friends mm. will change your perspective and your character. Amen, amen. The influence of our friends will change our character. Jadona, please take us through the punchlines you liked most and we can hear from the rest as well. What are some of the verses that I liked best? Uh, thank you for that. I'm really enjoying discussing this lesson. Um, and uh, one of the verses that stood out for me was uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Uh -huh. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Um, why it stood out for me is how many times do I worry rather than pray? Yeah, I worry so much about different decisions that um, I need to make in my life. But if I just uh, follow the counsel of this verse to trust God and not lean on my understanding and submit to him by prayer and communication with him, then I'll be able to um, understand my purpose and will. Amen. Lex? Well, for me, mine is Isaiah 30, 21, and I'll quickly read it. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And this is really touching to me because it shows that God is always there to guide you in your every step. And it shows that even though you fall, you'll still hear the voice of God saying, this is the way, you know, get up and walk in it. So it's really touching because it shows some guidance from God to us. Mm. It shows us God's will. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Finley? My favorite verse is Proverbs 11.5 says, The righteousness of the blameless makes their path straight, but the wicked are brought down by their own wickedness. Mm. So this text reminds you that you should be righteous all the time. Righteousness is important always. Then you will know God's will. Silas? Okay, I think we like the same verse when flex. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 30 verse 21 it says, Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, mm -hmm. This is the way, walk in it. Mm -hmm. It shows that God will always be there to remind you and show you the way. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. For me, I love the verse, 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, where the Bible says, Marvel not, my brothers, if the world hates you. I think sometimes as Christians, we're surprised when we go and proclaim the gospel of Christ and we get a lot of backlash and resistance, right? But the Bible is saying, don't be surprised. In fact, if it hated Jesus, why shouldn't you be hated? And that's even the warning that Jesus gave us. So I thought that that really was important as a punchline uh, for us. So with all these verses, they're important for us to keep in mind. So I'd like uh, Flex to read Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9. Maybe you can share with us from this verse and the story of Gideon and his soldiers. What is a lesson that we can pick out from this? All right. Um, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9 says, he who walks with integrity walks securely, mm -hmm. but he who perverts his ways will become known. Mm -hmm. Now, we can see this in the story of Gideon, how he reduced his, the number of uh, men he went into battle with, and this shows that he was walking in righteousness. He was walking with God, mm -hmm. and he trusted God enough to, to an extent that even though the numbers are few, and what he has is little compared to what he's fighting against. It shows that God is bigger than his problems. So he walked in with integrity, and it actually begs to differ where will we walk if we were in that time? Maybe mm. Finley can answer that. Where will you be? Will you be a part of the 300, or will you be among the people who went back home and to the camp? I will be part of the 300, man. <laughs> Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. I'd also like us to read Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And uh, Silas, you could share with us also the quote from the Spirit of Prophecy that talks about this. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. 
anyone that finds it uh, can read it. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, <laughs> For I know mm -hmm. the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to mm -hmm. give you an, an unexpected end. Mm. Man. Okay, the quote from the commentary says, the leader whom God chose to overthrow the Midianites occupied a prominent position in Israel. He was not a ruler or priest or Levite. He thought himself the least in his father's house, but God saw him a man of courage and integrity. He mm. was distrustful of himself and willing to follow the guidance of the Lord. God does not always choose for his work men of the greatest talents, but he selects those whom he can best use. So this talks about how you give up yourself for Christ. Mm -hmm. You let everything go and follow Christ. Mm. And this shows that that is the only way to succeed. Amen, amen. So as we come to the end of this lesson, I'd just like to get closing thoughts from each and every one of you. Starting with the teacher Donna, then we'll finish with Flex. I'll give the final one. Um, thank you for that. Uh, from this story, I've learned that um, it's important for us to know the will of God for our lives because it will help us to live um, lives much easier. And knowing God's will uh, applies in every aspect of our lives, whether it's in school, whether it's in church, whether it's what to post on Facebook, whether it's um, what to wear, God's will applies in all aspects. And for us to know God's will is to have constant communication with him mm -hmm. so that you are in tandem or you are on the same page with him. Okay, I would say trust in God no matter the situation because you never know what's happening next. Amen, amen. For me... God doesn't look at your size or position mm. like Gideon, but he looks at your abilities, where he strengthens it to his glory. Yes, what I get from this lesson is faith in God is something that is necessary to actually accept and follow the will of God in, in also alignment with communication with him. So mm. you have to communicate with him and trust that he will actually do it and have faith that it will be for a successful outcome that you can give him glory and honor. Amen, amen. For me, I, I think I'm returned back to the story of the fleece and I think it wasn't right for Gideon to actually ask God of this miracle. When God came to Gideon in Judges chapter, chapter 6 verse 12, God said, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Then in verse 13, and Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, why, if the Lord is with us, why then is all this befallen us? Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites? Now God had an interesting answer to Gideon. This is verse 14 of Judges 6. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Gideon had no reason to doubt God. God actually said, Is it not me who is sending you? When God speaks to you and calls upon you to do some work, it's not a matter of how inadequate you are, what talents you have, whether God will show you a sign if this is right or not. When God has promised he will be with us, let's trust him. And secondly, when we read Jeremiah 29, 11, as we read earlier, God says he has a plan, he has a purpose for each and every one of us. So when he has promised first to be with us, then he has promised that, that he has a purpose for us to actually have a good end, then our response should be, God, take me where you want me to go. In fact, our theme for church right now is, I will go. Because we want to go where God is actually leading us. And as we read in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, you shall hear a voice telling you, this is the right way, walk, this is the way. 
So it's up to us to respond to God. So that's the lesson to us to actually know God's will and let us not forget his promises. So just like God was with Gideon, God will be with us. So thank you all for joining us for the lesson today. Next week we'll be talking about you first, which will be the last lesson of this quarter, the Cornerstone Connection Guide, themed line in the sand. May God bless you all. I'd like to invite Lex to say a closing prayer for us. Let's bow down for the prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, O oh Lord, for everything you've done for us. O oh Lord, we ask that you help us understand and accept your will, Almighty Father. Help us have trust like Gideon did, Almighty God, to go with 300 men into battlefield, O oh Lord, where the enemy is stronger, Almighty God, because our God is stronger. May you be with the listeners, Almighty God. May they pick out something, and may you be with all of us. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.